Hi, I'm Donna Wilder. And I'm Janie Donaldson. Welcome to Quilt Central. Today, we're going to make a fun picnic quilt using a quick and easy serger technique. Learn how to choose the correct bed tune for the tour of the studio of a local artist. We're sure you will enjoy this show. Quilt Central is made possible in part by Janome America, makers of sewing machines and sergers. Janome, because you simply love to sew. APQS offers the Millennium and a full line of hand-guided quilting machines made in America's heartland for America's artisans. Sylvia Design Sewing Furniture, designed just for you. JT Trading Corporation, stick with us. Electric Quilt Company. Paducah McCracken County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Additional funding was provided by these companies that care about quilting. Welcome to Quilt Central, celebrating quilting in everyday living with your hosts, Jane Donaldson and Donna Wilder. One of the first things I learned about quilts is that you should never take them on a picnic. So why not make a quilt that's specifically designed to take on a picnic? And that's exactly what my guest is going to do today. Joining me is quilting expert, Maddie Bushman. Welcome, Maddie. Thank you very much, Donna. What a pleasure it is to be here. I want to show you something fun and exciting and quick to do. Quilting on the serger. That's great. Well, let's take a look at this picnic quilt. Tell me a little bit about it. Oh, I'd love to. This is what I call my picnic quilt for a Saturday picnic at home. Uh huh. When my nephews come over, my nephew Tony, and they love to go out in the backyard and have a picnic, I take this quilt out back and we use the center of it for our tablecloth uh -huh. and then we sit around the borders and just have ourselves a lovely picnic. And I like the way you use the fabrics to tie the uh, silverware together. Very clever. <laughs> and fun. And serging is a way to really do something quick and easily, isn't it? Actually, it is. And you can, if you wanted to, you can also establish a quarter inch seam uh -huh. using the serger. But today, we're not going to be using a quarter inch seam. We'll be using a half inch seam. OK, let's show them how we do it. I'm ready to go. Well, first of all, we're going to start out with seven inch blocks. Mm -hmm. OK, now I'm going to be using a half inch seam allowance. OK. Now, when you do flat locking, which is how we're going to be joining these squares together, uh -huh. I just wanted to mention to you that some people do like to use the blind hem foot. Uh huh. Okay, and that's for those people that really want to sew straight and don't normally have that comfortableness of sewing straight. Okay, but okay. you feel comfortable sewing straight. Good. Been doing it a long time. Yes. But I do use the blind hem foot for lots of other okay. applications. Mm -hmm. But let me show you. First, we're going to take one of the children's squares, yeah. and then we're going to take one of the dark squares. Now, when you flat lock, you always put wrong sides together. Okay. You know, I do want to uh, just mention a little bit more about flat locking. A lot of people are mystified by that uh -huh. and intimidated as well. What you need to understand is that the needle thread needs to be very loose which in most machines means from anywhere from zero tension for the tension dial to one. Okay. All right, now for your upper looper, which is where we're gonna have our decorative thread, uh -huh. you may notice that we have, uh, we're using variegated thread. I love it, it gives it's it, great. it gives it a fun look. And those primary colors are perfect. For Aren't this. they though? Yes. And then for our lower looper, we want that extremely tight because we uh -huh. want it to pull the needle thread across. Right. Okay, so let's go ahead and set it up, and we're going to use a half inch seam allowance, which there is a mark on the serger for that. Now, usually I lift the toe. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is just rotate the hand wheel a little bit, lift the toe manually so that it grabs the fabric. Okay. Now, as I said, I'm going to take a half inch seam allowance. Most times people will use no cutting. They will have the knife disengaged. Okay. But I like to have a little bit of seam allowance when I do it because I want to make sure that I've caught both pieces of fabric. 
Now, flat locking means that when you open that up, it has locked the two fabrics together. Is that the, the, the way it's defined? Instead of telling you, let me show you. Okay. So from the back, we're going to open it up, uh -huh. and oh, you can see okay. how it spreads. Yes. And you see those beautiful, those are called ladder stitches. Okay. And then I usually flatten them out. On mm -hmm. occasion, just from the wrong side, though, I would press it. Okay. And then you flip it over and oh, look how beautifully. Isn't that clever? Isn't that neat? That I just great. love that. Now, what you will do is, uh, as you look at the quilt, you would be adding your squares together. Mm hmm Okay, and that would mean taking one of your blue ones over here. Mm-hmm. And you would make whatever pattern you would like. Okay. Okay, now I used the seven inch squares and when they are sewn together, they end up being about six inches. Okay. Okay, and then I went five by five squares mm -hmm. so that I would uh, get a nice center block. And you want to mm -hmm. establish a nice center block. Okay. All right, then what you would do is what we do with serging a lot of times is we use a method called quilt as you go. Now that technique, the instructions for that are available on the website. Good. It's a little bit lengthy to go into right now, but it is available so that if anybody is unfamiliar with that technique, certainly they can refer to the website. Okay. So let's do one more. All righty. Just to show you. Isn't it, doesn't this go together so it quickly does. and fun? It I really. know, I love it. And is it, is the serger designed so that even a child could use it or is it something that you would recommend that only adults work on a serger? Well, I tell you, my niece, she's uh, 12, and I let her work with the serger, but you must keep in mind that it does have a knife. Right. Okay, it has an upper and a lower blade uh -huh. so that there is some cutting action involved. Okay. Okay, so you do want to kind of uh, be careful of that. And once again, you would open it from the back. Mm -hmm. Now, normally, let me also mention, normally when you can use the thread cutter uh -huh. that's on the machine, yep. but when I have heavy decorative threads in there, I do use a scissor. If you noticed, I use the yes. scissor. Because I don't want to undo any of those exactly. stitches. And look at how nice it's starting to oh, look. Isn't that wow. just so pretty? And then when you get several of these rows done, can you put two rows together and just go right over the... Exactly, as you can see on the quilt. Let's take another look at the quilt and see how we uh, surged by flat locking the rows together. Yes. We made our rows and then we flat locked row to row to row. Which is, it looks wonderful and it creates such a nice definition around each one of those squares. I know and it's fun. And like I said, when you look at the blue strips, you see that we did quilt as you go. Yes. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and change the thread. I want to show you this. Now we have the batting in here. Okay. Uh, let me also tell you one other uh, tip. When you're sewing with the serger and you have the batting in there and you're doing uh -huh. quilt as you go, it's best to adjust the stitch length okay. to three or four, something larger, again, okay. to allow for Let's the lock. Let's get sewing on this one. You've got it. What we have to do now is we're going to go ahead and change to some decorative thread. As you can see in here, we have our red and our white, which is similar to, a, it's like an off-white yeah. that we use to edge it. And it's really very easy to do. I'm always intrigued how quickly right. people do this. You know, why don't we take a look at it on the quilt itself and get a good look at how pretty that looks while we're changing the thread. Now that you have it all threaded, let's see how it stitches up. Let's give it a go. This is a four thread decorative stitch where we have our decorative thread in our upper and lower loopers. Uh huh. And that makes it beautiful. I like to use a four thread so that I have a little bit more stability. Well, it looks great, and I think it was such a good idea to create a picnic quilt. And I want to thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Joining us today is Debbie Trevino. She's a celebrity long arm teacher and a batting expert. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you very much, Janie. You know, batting is a, a, a large um, confusion to a lot of quilters. There's so many battings out on the market today. How do you choose the right battings to use for your projects? Yeah, we have lots of questions and we hope you can give us answers. Well, thank you. So you have run a test. I have. Um, I've been doing this for about um, eight years. And I wanted to know 
what batting did under the circumstances in which we may care for our quilted projects. And so probably the first thing I would, I would recommend doing is keeping a written record of how your tests are going. I see you, you actually keep a little, have typed yourself a little list. I do. Brand name, fiber content, recommended quilting distance, how did it needle, thread used, top and bottom, and appearance after quilting, bearding, shrinkage, and describe the appearance after washing, second and third washing. And we probably have to go over a little terminology yes. if we want to uh, keep a little record like that. So if you could give us a little briefing. Um, first of all, you want to ask yourself, is the batting I'm using, um, does it have a scrim? And a lot of people don't know what a scrim is, but I have a sample here of batting. This is, happens to be 100% cotton batting. And um, the scrim is a man-made fiber. It usually is a polypropylene or a man-made fiber content. It's kind of a non-woven. Yeah, it almost looks like an interfacing. Mm -hmm. And what they do when they manufacture the batting is they needle punch it, it's called. That's another term where a big machine with hundreds of needles punches the cotton fibers into that scrim. What the scrim does is actually stabilize the cotton. And I, have, oh. I have a sample here of a batting that is cotton that has no scrim, it's just needle punched, and it actually can Stretches. become quite distorted. But if you're going to hand quilt a project, this would be my choice. A little so easier I, to get the needle yes. through. I don't have to have fight the, the scrim. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that, so that, that's what scrim is and needle punching. Then, of course, we have polyester battings, and they're, some of them are bonded in different ways. There's chemical bonding, there's resin bonding, and there's thermal bonding. And, of course, thermal is heat. Um, sometimes latex is used in bonding. Um, okay. There's just different ways and you need to ask yourself if if these are the ones that you would like to work with and of course testing by making samples and washing. And washing them and that's what you have done. That's isn't right. It? We've taken, um, I've made two of each sample and I've, I've quilted one without laundering it um, because it looks absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. after I've quilted it. But yes. what's going to happen when I wash it? And the way that I wash these is the way that I would care for my personal quilt, which is putting it in a washing machine in tempered water and letting it soak, agitate just briefly, spin it, and then I fluff it in a dryer normally. But these I, I did dry. And certain manufacturers will tell you that a batting is machine washable but you need to see if it's conducive to the machines you're using. When you have tested these battings and read the instructions on the label, have you found most of the recommendations or their expectations for shrinkage to be true? Yes, yes, I'd give all the companies an A plus on specifications. We can rest assured as quilters that usually when we're purchasing a, a batting or a prepackaged batting that They've done extensive research in what their batting materials will do. But I wanted to see for myself so and test tested. and see if um, the shrinkage was, shrinkage was true. Probably the most important thing that I was looking for in battings was um, bearding. And yes. this is a good example. If you can get a close look, uh, a lot of people don't know what bearding looks like. It's all the little hairs that stick up like on a beard. Yes, and this actually, if I can show you, this is what it looked like prior, prior to laundering. Laundering, and this is what happened after it was laundered. And you can really see it on the black, all those little hairs, and those are like little short fibers. That did they work their way through? Yes, they migrated through the weave of the fabric, and of course, different weave fabrics are going to prevent some of that from happening. But how disappointing would it be if you spent hours and hours and hours on a project just to find out that the first time you laundered it, it was going to beard. Yeah. And to me, that's one of the most important reasons why you want to do testing of batting. This actually happens to be a wool bat, 100% wool, and wool is one of, one of the fibers that can beard. There, there are washable wools on the market that actually, I have some samples here. This is a washable wool. And and then I have. Is it like thermal bonded then? Uh, this is a, a this is a bonded wool, a washable wool, and just to show you the difference, this is a hand carded wool, and they both feel similar. This one you can feel the lanolin, 
and you can see some of the organic matter in the wool actually performed much better than the hand carded wool and if I were going to use, I, I usually tell my students that this is probably their pet, Betsy the sheep, and they just <laughs> gotta have a hand carded wool quilt with Betsy's wool in it. <laughs> I highly recommend scrimming your wool. And this is, there's, you could use interfacing, this just happens to be a cheesecloth. But I tested it to see if it would eliminate most of the bearding, and it did. So if we were going to hand tie or hand quilt a very large piece, we'd put that on one side or both sides? I would do it on both sides. Both sides. On both sides, um, create a scrim for your quilt. It's a lot of extra work if you just have to have yeah. Betsy's wool in there. <laughs> Otherwise, I would, I would probably purchase the... Pre-made. Pre-made wools that are out there, and there's some good ones. Um, another batting that a lot of people are not familiar with is silk. And what a mess, and silk is pretty messy. Um, but silk, I would, I would probably never use on cotton. I'd use it on silk. But silk is wonderful for garments. Silk on silk. Uh -huh. And uh, here's, these are cottons. Great for wall hangings, if, but you have to remember there is a straight of the grain. Cotton and bleached and unbleached. You have shown us so much today. You have so many samples. And you teach this class, don't you? Yes, I do. Well, I hope we'll see you at the Quilt Central Retreat. Well, thank you, Janie. Well, the relocation program, the way it's set up, in a nutshell, is we offer an opportunity to artists. We offer them an arts community, which, which Paducah is, and it's a growing arts community, and for them to be a part of it, for them to actually own something. Most of them are coming from these large cities. They can't own anything. Mark Baroni's narrative paintings, charcoals, drawings, and etchings illustrate his journey of surrender to God's will. He chose St. Luke, the patron saint of artists, to represent the spiritual and artistic aspects of his work. The way St. Luke's Press is set up, um, this was a building that I did under the relocation program, and uh, it was a very neglected building when I got it. And I always wanted something where people could come in and view my work, uh, uh, very somewhat Chicago sort of flavor where there were the, you had the track lights and you had all the work where you could have openings and that's why I had when people came into the place it was really a gallery. Two-thirds of my space is, is studio space because I need that kind of work for the presses, I need that work for my easels and everything else. It, it was set up so I could actually interact with people that came in, they could actually see, you know, and, it, and it's able to show them how the prints are run and, and what I'm doing because a lot of people don't understand that um, a print like you buy in the store that's poster-like and an etching are two different things. And, and it allows them to see what I'm doing. It allows them to see the materials I'm using and everything else. And So that's the way I set it up. I set it up as a, a place to display work in the front and then in the back was where I worked and, uh, and upstairs I live. So. If you've ever wondered what kind of thread to use for a project, my guest today is going to share some good tips on selecting thread. Joining me is Danita Reeve, who is a long arm quilting and regular quilting expert. Welcome, Danita. Thanks, Donna. It's nice to be here. Um, I've done a lot of different kinds of sewing in the past, and you'll probably agree that it's really important to choose the right kind of thread for your project. As a quilter, what I primarily use is cotton thread. Uh -huh. So it's real important to me to um, have a thread, a good thread selection for my customer quilt, so that no matter what thread I pull out of, what quilt I pull out of the cabinet, I've got the right color of thread. And uh, for starters, for piecing, I re really like to use a lightweight thread, like a 50 weight thread. Because well, I'm always confused about the numbering system. Now, you're already talking about 50 weight thread, and I suspect some of our viewers aren't quite sure how they do that. Well, I'm sure they are. It's really kind of a confusing process. Some thread is sold by text and some is sold by mm -hmm. weight, and that is really a, a measurement um, for thread that talks about the thickness of the okay. thread. And so, for instance, when you're talking about the weight of thread, as the number gets higher, the thread gets skinnier. Seems like it should be the opposite. It does, doesn't it? Um, and when you're talking about text, it goes exactly the opposite direction. Okay. But the thread I've brought along today is sold by weight. Okay. So the 50 weight thread is the finest thread, and this is what I like to use for piecing. Okay. It's a real strong thread, and yet uh -huh. it's um, fine enough that it doesn't take up, up much here. room 
in your block as you're mm -hmm. doing your piecing. Okay. You know, you, they always tell you to be careful of that scant quarter inch seam. Yes. With this thread, you don't have to be quite so conscientious about that because it just doesn't take up very much room. Oh, that's and a, good tip. a lightweight thread like this is also what I would recommend for someone wanting to do hand applique and hide really well when you're doing uh -huh. those little tiny hand stitches. That's a good suggestion. I've often seen where the thread is too thick for that kind of concealing it beneath and the applique. It, it makes it bulky and it shows up mm -hmm. too much, I yeah. think. Now, what would you use for this beautiful quilting that you've done here? Well, for long arm quilting and also for machine quilting on your domestic machine, kind of the most popular threads are a 40 weight thread. Okay. And this seam, it, they're all designed to run on high speed machines and they work really well on your domestic machine or your long arm and both in the top and the bobbin. Okay. My personal favorite, though, is to use a little bit heavier weight on the top of my long arm machine. I'll mm -hmm. still run the 40 weight thread in the bobbin, but you'll notice here, this is the 28 weight thread, and it's a little bit heavier, gives you a little bit more pronounced look, it shows up a bit more, and don't you think that it gives it a lot of dimension and texture, and it almost gives it the look of hand quilting? It does. Now, what happens with the tension when you use a... Uh, uh, different thread on the top and a different thread on the bottom. All my good sewing tells me you shouldn't do that. Does it pull it down a little bit? Well, for the long arm machines, you just want to have a combination between the top and the bottom thread that still is going to um, drop off your bobbin hook easily and pull up through the machine oh, without taking up too much space and getting caught in there. So now, what are you well. doing here with the blanket stitch? Well, we all love the look of a hand appliqued piece, but mm -hmm. I rarely have time to do that kind of thing. So for me, doing a, a raw edge applique with a buttonhole stitch is a really good answer to do an applique. I have a little, um, a little bit of stabilizer underneath here, and I'll run my machine at a little bit slower speed to uh -huh. do this. It's a little bit fussy. And, and what weight thread? I've got a 28 weight thread. Okay. I think that sort of replicates the look of, of doing a buttonhole stitch uh -huh. by hand. So this you want to just always stop with your needle in the down position so you can stop and pivot your work a yes. little bit and sort of have control of where those stitches go at the point for instance. I'm always amazed when you have these people who can do the beautiful machine applique. It's, uh, it's a real art, but I think it's sort of like once you practice on it, it becomes a little bit easier. Well, sure it does. It's just like anything else, and you just want to remember that when you're going around a, even a slight curve, you might want to stop with your needle down, raise your presser foot slice slightly, uh -huh. so you can do a nice, a nice curve. Let's stop and take that out and, and show everybody the nice detail that you get. And I like the fact that you use the black thread there. It really accentuates all of the, the stitching that's on there. That is really pretty there. Now, th the thing that amazes me is the variety of colors that are available in threads. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, it is like a rainbow, and you uh, you know you just love the colors. Now you've got it in the spools, and it's also available. I guess you use this on the long arm. Is that correct? Yeah, the smaller spools will also run on the long arm machines, and this might be a good choice if you um, had sort of an unusual color that uh -huh. you weren't going to use very much of. But if it's something that you're going to use quite a bit, it's really. Um, easier and more cost effective to have it on a big cone. Let's look at that. There's a white quilt underneath here that really has some lovely quilting in it. And what size thread did you use on that one? This one was done with the 40 weight thread, but it still shows up quite a bit because you've got such high contrast yeah. between the thread and the background. Now this, I think, is very cute too, and this was a little bib that you did. Isn't that fun? You know, so many people anymore have the um, high-end domestic machines yep. that have all the embroidery capabilities. And, and this one was of, polyester thread? Yes, that's done Great. with polyester. And the reason the embroiderers really like the poly thread is that it's got such a high shine to Good. it. Well, thank you for all the tips and now I know a lot more about threads. Thanks, Donna. I learned so much from Danita's thread tips today. Yes, and I thought Maddie's quilt was just great. I hope you enjoyed our program today. Please join us next time to learn the churn dash block and ideas for brainless borders, stamping on fabrics, and raw edge applique. See you then. Quilt Around the Clock. Visit the Quilt Central website at www.quiltcentraltv.com for more information on this program.
Central is made possible in part by Janome America, makers of sewing machines and sergers. Janome, because you simply love to sew. APQS offers the Millennium and a full line of hand-guided quilting machines made in America's heartland for America's artisans. Sylvia Design Sewing Furniture, designed just for you. JT Trading Corporation, stick with us. Electric Quilt Company, Paducah McCracken County Convention and Visitors Bureau. Additional funding was provided by these companies that care about quilting. Celebrate quilting in your everyday living. To purchase videotapes of this or any episode of Quilt Central, you may call toll-free at 1-866-PADUCA.